My name is Susan Testrode Bergeron, and I am interviewing Mr. Kerry St. Pei about his memories and experiences concerning Louisiana's coastal wetlands. The interview is being conducted at 7.20 a.m. on April 26, 2012. The interview, interview is being conducted at Mr. Dean Blanchard's camp on Lake Verrett, commonly known as the Tumble Down. Uh, thank you for signing your consent forms. Do you understand that portions of this taped interview and pictures taken during the interview may be used in government publications? I do. Okay, very good. Thank you for speaking with me today, and we've gone over the consent forms, and I'd like to get some basic information on tape, and then we'll go on to the interview. Would you please state your full name? My name is Kerry Michael St. Bay. And what is your date of birth, and where were you born? I was born in... Uh, Actually, New Orleans, and, uh, and then I quickly moved back to Port South, Louisiana, in Franklin's Parish. Okay. And what's your birth date? June 15th, 1950. Okay. Tell me a little bit about a childhood memory that connects you to the Louisiana wetlands. Well, that, that would be uh, my times camping out on the ridges that... Um, came from the Mississippi River and uh, intertwined with the wetlands in uh, Plaquemines Parish in Port South, Louisiana. Uh, these were uh, great forests that followed ridges uh, of, of living live oaks and uh, I camped out on those very often with, with my friends. So who were you camping out with? Uh, with my good friends uh, growing up, uh, Corky Cairns, uh, Leighton Beers, uh, Michael Evier, and uh, we'd camp out there. We had an eight-foot uh, aluminum flat boat uh, with a, powered with a three-and-a-half horsepower Evinrude, <laughs> and we'd go out uh, and spend all day getting out to the places, and uh, then we'd camp out. So. So what, when you were on a camp out, what were some of the things that, that y'all would do that were <clears throat> fun or interesting? Uh, well, we'd swim, we'd fish. Um, the, these uh, places became mystical. They were, you know, places that uh, took a long time to get to. It was probably because we were, you know, eight foot boat with a, a three and a half horsepower Avenue, but. Uh, uh, we'd pile up all our gear in that boat and uh, travel what seemed like hours uh, way out deep in the in the marshes and uh, we'd get on these uh, these uh, mystical ridges uh, covered with uh, living live oaks and uh, draped with moss and uh, populated with uh, palmettos and uh, would actually uh, pray that, uh, that there would be a summer storm coming up and uh, that would force us to build a little lean-tos, which we liked, and uh, we'd weather the storm, and uh, then we just explored after that. Okay. Um, if you had to say how these experiences affected your decisions, as an adult, how, how would you describe that transition from some of those childhood memories towards your adulthood? Well, I think uh, growing up where I grew up uh, gave me a, a, an appreciation for the environment that surrounded me. And there's no question uh, that that environment influenced me to become a biologist. Uh, from as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a biologist, and I wanted to work in a field that uh, where I could protect what, what was around me. And I ended up uh, working exactly in the job that my dream job, the job I wanted. I worked for Water Pollution Control <coughs> Division. Uh, <coughs> it was under Wildlife and Fisheries at first, uh, and eventually became uh, was called DQ. Um, but that job gave me uh, exactly what I wanted to do. So what happened some of your interactions while you were working in water pollution control? I mean, if you had to kind of say, <coughs> about what year was that? 
Well, I started in 1974. Okay, so you started in 74. So kind of talk about the climate of that time and, and your job. Well, it was wide open. I mean, we, we all got very little training. Uh, we were given basic equipment and uh, basically told to go out and stop water pollution. <laughs> and uh, the area that was assigned to me uh, was the region around Homa, uh, the, the area that later became the Barataria Tabon National Estuary. Um, and water pollution uh, was very common back then. Uh, industrial discharges, um, the discharges that were causing serious environmental damage. Um, but, you know, being new to the field and not having anybody to train me, um, we didn't know where to look for the water pollution. Uh, we were very busy. Uh, had people, we'd respond to citizens' complaints, uh, but we didn't know where to look for the water pollution. Uh, for instance, we'd travel in bayous, uh, streams, and uh, we'd see oil and gas facilities, um, all freshly painted, the, the tanks were painted, and uh, we didn't realize that what you had to do was actually get out on that, uh, that spoil bank uh, to see all the damage that was caused behind. Uh, and that opened up the whole world to me. And I became uh, very uh, vigilant uh, with damage in, in the oil, oil, oil fields. So how did the local people feel about the work that you were doing? Because I know you had a lot of interaction with the public throughout your whole career. A lot of interaction with the public. The, the, we'd rely on the public to, to call us and uh, you know, alert us to uh, water pollution problems. Uh, um, I became you know, very close to people. Uh, um, I met a lot of people. And, uh, interacted with people a lot and uh, you know some some of them elderly some of them young some of them uh, middle-aged uh, but uh, I was always uh, I was uh, I was always uh, partial to, to the elderly people because they had uh, problems that they they were seeing they knew that there was a problem they didn't uh, understand what that problem was. They just knew it was a problem. And they would call me and almost apologize for bothering me, you know, uh, to alert me to a problem. And uh, so I was always partial to elderly people. And I was, uh, you know, it was, a, it was an honor to, to help them out. And uh, well, I'd investigate the, the issue of problem. Uh, then report on it and uh, request enforcement action. Um, you've kind of changed your focus over the years. It's not just water pollution control anymore. Tell us sort of why you changed your focus and how that's different. <clears throat> well, I, I don't think uh, I did change my focus that much. Um, I was always protective of the environment. I was always uh, uh, working to correct some issue, uh, and I gained a lot of experience and a lot of awareness as to um, what those problems were. And I mean, whereas we had, um, I could point to a direct cause of land loss, of marsh loss, acres and acres of marsh loss due to uh, produce water or oil field brine discharges. Um, later in my career, I became aware of a bigger land loss issue. Um, all the marshes were disappearing before my eyes and I could see it. I knew it was happening, uh, but I didn't know 
it was so vast. I didn't know uh, it was such a, a serious issue until about uh, 1980 or so. And uh, it's, it's the wetlands that make our people what they are. Uh, it's, it's really all about the people. Uh, it's the wetlands that, that are responsible for, for, you know, forging the culture that we have. We're all bayou people. We're all marsh people, all wetlands people. Uh, the people here in southeast Louisiana uh, is referred to as a unique culture. It's unique because most of our people can point to their first ancestor that came here in this region uh, generations ago. Uh, and no matter what culture you come from, your ancestor came here and he stayed and you stay. So we have this rich mixture of cultures intertwined uh, and it's, that's, that's the thing that makes this place unique and it's because of the wetlands. That's why people come here and that's why people like to stay. So it's all about the wetlands. Um, the wetlands are us, and uh, we are the wetlands, and uh, that's why it's so important to save it.